right there in Australia, it's around 10 p.m. And if we go by a webinar of one and a half hour, it means that she has to, she has to be awake till 11.30. But that's the passion, not only for the communication, but the passion to pay back to the society. We are also glad that we cannot put it to the words that she has acceded to our request. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I just want to ensure that uh, I'm audible. Am I audible? Yes, yes ma'am. Perfect. Can I have the PPT, sir? Uh, yeah, uh, PPT. Good evening, participants. I'm Pinky Shama Johnny. <clears throat> well, well, that was a nice encomium from sir, but I don't know if I really deserve it. Uh, but I'll try to do justice. Uh, this is my debut webinar. And pardon me if I sound really petrified. I'm not used to this virtual setup where you just look into the screen, knowing whether your audience is active or not. So, however, uh, I'll try to do justice uh, to the topic. Uh, so I welcome you to this webinar on enhancing the art of written communication. Uh, can we have the first slide, sir? Yeah. Yes. So before we begin, I would like to tell you about the four important components of communication skills. That is LSRW. You might have come across it, uh, but we don't know how exactly it works. LSRW stands for listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So listening comes first. When a child is born, it learns to listen first, then it starts speaking, and then comes reading, and finally writing. So writing is a difficult component, and that's why it's placed last. Because unlike uh, speaking, writing is not acquired. It is a skill that has to be honed and developed over time with practice. So we will be looking at two important uh, forms of writing. The one is informal and the other is formal writing. We all know that we use informal means of communication with our uh, relatives, close friends, and our colleagues. But when it comes to uh, a work setup or when you are trying to communicate with your uh, management or higher officials, then you, use, uh, you have to use formal language or formal written communication. So it is important to understand what to include and what not to when it comes to written communication. So here you have to understand that both of these forms of writing serve different purposes. Informal has a milder tone. Uh, it is more personal where, uh, where, where, when compared to formal, which is less personal. The tone, the diction, and the construction also vary when compared to formal and informal writing. So when I say diction, I'm talking about the choice of words. When I say tone, I'm talk, uh, talking about the level of expressing your emotions. When I talk about construction, I'm talking about the patterns. In informal uh, uh, written language, you can have dangling constructions, incomplete sentences, but as long as your message is conveyed to the person, it is fine, it is acceptable. But in formal language, it is not so. So you have to understand <clears throat> that formal language is less personal and does not use colloquialisms. What do I mean by colloquialisms? I'm talking about slang, words like uh, hep or chick or fired, busted. All these words are slang words and cannot be used in formal language. Even unparliamentary words like obscene or vulgar language is a big no in formal language. And of course, chat language, the contracted forms of you and about, uh, TYSM for thank you so much or laugh out loud, LOL or ASAP or as soon as possible, please avoid such chat language also in your formal language and avoid the usage of contractions like didn't, couldn't, wouldn't, shouldn't. Instead, use the full forms like did not, do not, will not, cannot, uh, and so on. And when I'm talking about contractions and uh, shortage, uh, I mean shortening of forms, remember that you should not be using this uh, etc as well, because etc only uh, means that you do not have enough information. There's lack of information, and and you're trying to cover up with this etc. Unless you're trying to cover a big area and you do not have space, try to avoid the usage of etc. or uh, and so on. So uh, coming to first person pronouns, like 
I and we. We quite often use I and we when we write, but in formal communication, we have to understand that the usage of first person pronouns like I and we should be avoided. We were all taught in school to write formal letters, isn't it? You, you need to have the from, the to address, and then um, the subject, the salutation. When it comes to salutation, you, uh, I, I, re I really wanna share this with you because some people still write respected sir and madam, but even in formal communication, the respected is gone. It's gone out of usage. We use only dear sir or madam. And if you know the person's name, then you can use the name instead. So with the Americanization of everything, now uh, within the uh, work environment, people call people by their first names. I don't know how it is in India now, but uh, when I was working with Cognizant, it was like that. So things change, so it is important for us to adapt to the change. And when talking about letters, uh, we, are, we were taught in school to write formal letters like as I'm suffering from fever and all those things. And uh, um, I would like to share one particular incident that really uh, took me by surprise or shock, I should say, uh, because um, I wanted to check the level of uh, formal letter understanding. Uh, uh, I, I was teaching students from the university and um, I asked them to write a formal letter. And I was shocked to see something on the paper that said, as I'm suffering from my marriage, but what he intended to say was, as I'm suffering, uh, as, I, um, I, and as I'm getting married. So instead of saying, as I'm getting married, he has written, as I'm suffering from my marriage. But in today's context, you can always say, yes, maybe you're suffering from marriage. And if you ask my husband, he would definitely watch for it to 200%, I guess. Well, with that lighter note, um, so it, it, it has to be understood that we do not start sentences with I or we in formal letters. It's always as, or this is regarding, or um, this is to bring to your notice. That's how we begin formal letters. And then the use of phrasal verbs. It is a good thing to use phrasal verbs, especially when you're learning a language and when you want to express your feelings in an intimate manner, but remember, Phrasal verbs are a big no again in formal language. So you can use one word substitutions instead. I have given you a list on the PPT. If you can see that, look down on can be replaced with despise. Talk, to, talk about can be discuss. Set up can be organized. Put forward can be propose. So uh, moreover, you have to understand that opinions really matter a lot, but without facts, that can substantiate your ideas, opinions are not entertained in formal writing. So please stick to facts rather than opinions when it comes to formal writing. Can I have the next slide, please? Well, we have the types of writing styles here. I would like to tell you because you have to know how, uh, what kind of style you would like to adapt. So the first one is um, descriptive writing style. The descriptive writing style is giving vivid descriptions about a person or a thing or an event. It could be anything, but when you try to give a visual impact to the reader, then you use the descriptive writing style. The narrative writing style is quite different from the descriptive style because it literally narrates a story or an episode or an anecdote, and uh, it is from a first person aspect. So if you want to tell something, from your own perspective, or if you want to narrate an incident, then you use the narrative writing style. Analytical writing style is used to analyze complex uh, ideas and come up with findings and solutions and give uh, suggestions on a particular complex issue. On the other hand, we have the expository uh, writing style, which is to inform. When I say inform, it is about <clears throat> bringing to notice uh, something about a new ideas or novel concepts, when you want to introduce such things to the readers, then you use an expository style. And then you have the persuasive writing style, which we, uh, the name itself is suggestive. When you want to persuade someone or when you want to convince the reader of what your message is about, then you use a persuasive style. We can see such persuasive writing styles in promotional material where, um, 
you know, the companies want to sell their products. So they come up with innovative, persuasive writing to you know, uh, get the attention of the customers and boost their sales. Then you have the argumentative writing style in which you select an idea or an already established idea and you talk for or against the idea. So that's about the argumentative writing styles. The last two writing styles are, are uh, in recent trend, the technical writing and the creative writing. Technical writing is all about giving instructions to people. For example, when you get a gadget or an electronic appliance, you always get a user manual or a user reference, uh, which you can see, uh, you, which you can read and understand. It gives you a set of instructions to follow to, uh, to use a particular gadget or appliance. So that is about technical writing. Professional writing like copywriting and content development or, are also in uh, Vogue. You also have creative writing and the sole purpose of creative writing is mostly entertaining the readers. Yeah. You have fiction, nonfiction, and all forms of nonfiction like magazines, anything that is informative and at the same time, creative and entertaining. Can I have the next slide, please? Well, it is important to understand the elements of effective writing before you begin writing. You should know the purpose of your writing. You should have a purpose. Why are you writing that particular piece of work? What should be the outcome? Are you expecting an action from the other side? So understand the purpose of writing and then start your writing. Audience is another important aspect. You should know who your target audience will be beforehand. If you're writing for a child, use simple language. If you're writing a research article, then use the appropriate language. Or if you're writing to your manager requesting for something, then again, the structure, the pattern, everything is different when it comes to audience. So the level of formality or the degree of formality depends on the uh, factors relating to your audience. So clarity, clarity is very important because sometimes there are words and sentences that can sound uh, ambiguous, which can lead to misinterpretation or miscommunication. So it is important to avoid such ambiguous words and sentences and keep it clear so that your reader will get the message effectively. Unity, when talking about unity, Unity is uh, uniformity that you find in the entire piece, the entire piece of writing. It is connected with coherence and cohesion. When talking about coherence, what is the difference between coherence and cohesion? Coherence is the unity of ideas or the logic behind the ideas, the way you present your ideas. Cohesion is to do with the unity of structural elements, the grammatical parts of it, or the words and the determiners, the linkers, the adjectives, the prepositions that you use to make your sentences meaningful. I can give you a simple example to understand coherence and cohesion. Coherence is more like a building as a whole. You know, so it's, it's an idea, but cohesion involves the structural materials or the building materials like bricks and cement, if, if it makes any sense. So we'll move on to the next slide. It is also important to know about semantics and syntax before developing your writing skills. You should know what semantics is because semantics is the study of meaning. And unless you know the meaning of a word or how to use it, you can never be successful in writing well. So uh, semantics involves two types. There is conceptual meaning and associative meaning. The conceptual meaning is nothing but uh, the literal meaning, uh, let's take the example of a house. When I say house, people think of a building or a place of dwelling, but the associative meaning will be the people living in it or happy families or even the furniture. It could be anything that can be inside or associated with the conceptual meaning. So the syntax, when we talk about syntax, it's merely the arrangement of words and phrases to create well-informed sentences in a language. So it is important to arrange the words. Let's say, for example, I say, I will call you tomorrow, makes sense. But if I rearrange the words, tomorrow I will call. 
or call will i tomorrow does it make sense no okay it sounds ridiculous so it is important to arrange the words these words make sentences sentences are built into paragraphs paragraphs into essays and essays uh, are found in uh, books or uh, compiled as books uh, so this is how the syntax structure works next please <clears throat> can i have the next slide please Yes, I know this sounds really elementary because you would have read about the, uh, the four kinds of sentences and uh, sentence patterns when you were in school, but it is important to remember these because somehow down the memory lane, we have forgotten so many things and these are some of them. So let's just quickly brush up our memory, jog our memory a bit and see what we have missed out on. So the kinds, uh, kinds of sentences include statements, questions, exclamations, and commands. Statements are mostly declarative sentences or assertive sentences that do not require any action. Tomorrow is a holiday. We own a cat, period. And punctuation marks are important when we talk about sentences. A statement will carry a period, which we often call as full stop. But the grammatical expression for a full stop is a period. So we use period for statements, Questions obviously end with a question mark, like where is the cat? And then exclamations obviously will end with an exclamatory mark. When you want to show your heightened emotions, you use exclamatory sentences. And when our commands used, when you want to give orders or when you want to make requests, then you use, sometimes you use exclamatory marks or sometimes it is just a period. Let's see uh, the example here for command is feed the cat. An exclamation, the cat is cute. You use an exclamatory because you're trying to express an heightened emotion there. What a lovely day. Okay, so that'll be an exclamatory mark again. Let's move on to the next uh, slide, please. This is a bit boring, but I have to talk about it. Um, sentence structures, are important in language or especially in written language because it can help you in uh, building uh, sentences of varying levels or uh, varying lengths. And um, you should have sentences of varying lengths to make it more readable. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the first uh, kind of sentence structure is simple sentence. So in a simple sentence, you will find only one independent clause, which we also uh, call as a main clause. One independent clause, which is, I kick the ball. That If I try to split the sentence, there will not be any meaning in it. I kicked. If I stop, with I kicked. Then what is unanswered? And if I say the ball, what with the ball? That again is unanswered. So again, it does not make any sense if I try to split the sentence. So this is an independent clause, a simple sentence. And in compound sentence, you have two or more independent clauses. Okay, so let's see the example. I kicked the ball and it hit Tom. If I remove the and there and look at it as two different sentences, let's say I kicked the ball, uh, that is one sentence. It hit Tom, it still makes sense. So it is another independent clause or main clause. So when you have two independent or main clauses, then you have a compound sentence. What is a complex sentence then? So one independent clause and one or more dependent clauses. Now we're talking about dependent clauses. What are dependent clauses? Dependent clauses are merely subordinate clauses, which are completely dependent on the independent clause. It cannot stand alone and give meaning or give the complete meaning. Let's see the example. Tom cried because the ball hit him. Now, if I split the sentence, Tom cried, full stop. It does give some amount of meaning. But if I say, because the ball hit him, it does not give any meaning. Because the ball hit him, what happened is unanswered. So it is dependent on the first part for its meaning. So that is why it's called a dependent clause or a subordinate clause. So a complex sentence will have one dependent clause and one or more dependent clauses. And a compound and complex um, a compound or complex uh, sentence structure will have 
two or more independent clauses and one or more dependent clauses. Now, now this all sounds really complicated, but if you see the example, you can understand better. Tom cried because the ball hit him and I apologized immediately. Now, the, the, uh, the part which is in yellow, if you can see that, Tom cried. If I put a period there, then it becomes a separate sentence. In between, you have because the ball hit him. That is a dependent clause because that does not give any meaning by itself. And the final yellow uh, part, I apologized immediately, period. That again is a dependent, uh, independent clause because it gives meaning by itself. So when you have two or more independent or main clauses, a combination of independent and dependent clauses, then it's a compound complex sentence structure. It is important for you to know different forms so that you can form different structures and enhance your writing skills. Can I have the next slide, please? We move on to paragraph construction. Now that we have seen about sentences, the next big thing is the paragraph. Paragraphs have three important components, the introduction, the body, and conclusion. Every paragraph should have an uh, uh, an introduction or a topic sentence. We call it introducers in technical uh, terms. And you have the body uh, uh, in which you have developers. And then you have the conclusion in which you have terminators. In the topic sentence, you have introduced that introduce or defines a topic. And in the body, the developers try to substantiate your main idea. You have a central idea and you have substantiating ideas to support that central idea. And in the conclusion, you have terminators, which uh, include the summary, which have linking words and connecting words to the next paragraph. So it is important that these three aspects are always present in your paragraph construction. And remember, when talking about main idea, one paragraph can only deal with one main idea. If you want to talk about two main ideas, please uh, begin another paragraph. You cannot have two main ideas in a single paragraph. Uh, when it comes to the length, the, minim uh, the minimum that you would be looking at is four to five lines in a paragraph, and the maximum is at 10 to 15. But if it runs to one whole page, the reader is going to get bored and uh, the continuity of thought will be lost. So keep your paragraphs well constructed, keep it uh, between uh, four and eight or 10 lines at the maximum. Can we have the next slide? Yes. I came across this very interesting acronym, VIP COWS, which will help you in writing, if you remember, but this is not in a particular order that we use when we write, but um, it is important to remember the voice, ideas, presentation, conventions, that is the editing process, organization, choice of words, that uh, word choice, that is the diction, and um, uh, sentence fluency, all this is very important, but I'm not going to touch upon this because you know that writing is a vast topic. It's like a notion and we are just dealing with little drops of this big ocean. So let us not focus on this today. I'm going to move on to the next slide, please. Well, <clears throat> writing for a purpose. You might have to write on several locations, it's considering your profession uh, that you are in. So you must know your jargon. By jargon, I mean specific lexicon used in a profession or other community practice like doctors and lawyers, they have a different jargon. And register is something uh, that you have to understand. It's the degree of formality whom you're talking to or whom you're addressing. Is it your uh, friend or um, an employer, it depends on that. <clears throat> Let's take a quick uh, example of medical report. You will not find a sentence like this. The person has been admitted for a broken bone on the left leg toe. Will you ever find a sentence like that? No, you would rather find one like this. The patient has been admitted for a compound fracture of the left metatarsal bone. So that's the jargon that doctors use. Let's see another example. Swelling and pain reduction pills were given. Absolutely not written that way. You will find something like anti-inflammatory medicines have been prescribed. And in the, uh, ja um, the slide, can you just scroll up a bit? 
yes okay so um, okay another example is from uh, yeah 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 another uh, another example is from um, the court language this is an example that you will find in the notice of petition or dispossessed as you call it to the people mentioned above in occupancy of the house you're in okay i've, I've not completed the sentences uh, sentence because i didn't want to bring up the entire paragraph because of uh, the time constraint that i have so you would rather find something more formal and professional like to the respondents mentioned above in possession of the premises herein. So you can see that people becomes respondents, occupancy becomes possession, house becomes uh, premises. So that is how you choose your words and uh, understand the jargon of your particular field. Right. Um, before, before moving on to the writing tips, I want to have a quick task because I, I know it's it's been uh, too theoretical. So let us have a quick task. I want you to grab a pen or a pencil and paper. And if you don't have one, please relax, it's fine. You can just imagine. I want you to write or think about two sentences about yourself. If I was asking um, you to describe uh, yourself, your likes or something, just think about two sentences. I'll give you 30 seconds to think, and then I'll come out with how you can analyze. Just think about two sentences about yourself. If you have to tell, describe yourself or your talents. Well, well, the clock is ticking. Have you thought about two sentences? Now, I know that you cannot share your views here, but you know what you have uh, you know, thought of or written. So now if your sentence, both your sentences begin with, I am so-and-so, I am working here, I like this thing, or I dislike this thing, then you're at the beginning level because you haven't shown any variation in your writing. You have begun with I, I, which is a big no, right? You could probably say my, if, if you have written, my name is so-and-so uh, and I like doing certain things. If you have a my and a I, fair enough. But you have, if you have begun your sentence by saying, being a lawyer, my passion is law or if you have begun the second sentence also in a different way, then way to go, you already have good writing skills. Okay, this is a kind of a self-analysis that I wanted to uh, do. You know what you thought of or what you wrote on the paper. So you know what your level is now. And so these tips now that I'm going to discuss will help you in um, achieving perfection. I wouldn't say perfection because nobody is perfect. Everybody is in the process of learning. So at least near perfection. So let's see what we have in the beginning. The first point is research the topic before you begin writing. You should know what you uh, are going to write about. See what people other uh, what other people have to say about it. See if uh, you can find um, opinions, facts relating to your uh, topic if you have enough resources to substantiate your ideas, this will give you a brief picture or a structure and it'll help you uh, have a flow of thoughts without having a writer's block. So then you, uh, then you need to be accurate and not vague. See for, the, if, see for example, I enjoy listening to music. I'm not giving enough information, but in the second sentence, I'm giving you precisely what I like. I enjoy listening to different kinds of music like hip hop, rap, jazz. So I'm being very specific. So it is important to be specific and accurate when you start writing and use simple language. But within brackets, I've mentioned contextual because you cannot use simple language in all contexts. For example, when you write a research paper or um, uh, something complex or a news article, you cannot use simple language. You have to uh, use 
appropriate language or formal language so that the readers will have some kind of a respect for you, right? So next, please. Yes, uh, we're continuing with the writing tips. That's why you will find writing tips over and over again. So keep it short and simple. Remember the KISS principle. Okay, it is always good to keep it short and simple and avoid using long winding sent sentences because there's more scope for ambiguity and confusion when you use long sentences. Let's take a look at the quick example that I've given. I was driving home late yesterday night and I was feeling sick and tired because of all the hard and hectic work throughout the day. You could probably think about and uh, uh, condense it and uh, keep it short and simple in this way. I drove home last night feeling exhausted after an uncompromising schedule. Does it make sense? Yeah, I drove home. I'm not using the past continuous because that's two words. I'm just using the simple past tense. I drove home and instead of using yesterday night, I'm, I'm saying, Last night, it is always good to say last night, tonight instead of today night, and so on. All right. And then I'm using exhausted in the place of sick and tired, and in the place of hard and hectic work throughout the day, I'm using uncompromising schedule. So it is always when you st when you start writing, it is difficult for you, you will end up with a lot of words. But when you rewrite, you can always delete unnecessary or eliminate unnecessary words. Use active voice instead of passive voice because passive voice can be long and boring. Let's take the example of Tom drove the car. So how do you identify a, 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 a sentence that is an active voice? Let's say Tom drove the car. You have the subject, the verb, and the object. The subject here is Tom, drove is the verb, and the car is the object. But if I reverse the order and put the subject at the end and bring the object to the front, then it becomes a passive voice. The car was driven by Tom. It becomes verbose, isn't it? You have a few extra words in the sentence. So try to avoid passive voice and stick on to the active voice un uh, unless it's necessary for you to switch to the passive voice. So keep paragraphs short. This I told you already uh, when we discuss uh, the length of the paragraphs, so keep it short. Next slide, please. Right. It is always good to remember um, that you cannot use fillers or what you call as fluff words, very, little, rather, really, just, totally, completely. All of these are just fillers. They're not adding any valuable meaning to your sentences. They are just occupying space. So try to eliminate these fluff words that do not add value to your writing because your writing will sound more authentic and formal when you do not use fluff words. Then you have, do not deviate from the core idea discussed. Sometimes we have a tendency to deviate from the main idea and talk about something that is irrelevant. So try and avoid doing that. So when you rewrite your, uh, re, uh, reread your script, then you can come, uh, sometimes you come across irrelevant uh, sentences, which you can always go back and tell it. So uh, let's take the example of backpackers and travelers are unhappy due to the COVID situation, which shocked the world. Speaking of the origin of the word world, it has an interesting ancient root, which meant age or life of man. Now, why is the second sentence there after the first sentence? What has backpackers and travelers and COVID situation got to do with the ancient root word of the word world? Okay, so this is kind of deviating or distracting from, uh, you're deviating from the main idea. So please remember to stick to the core idea and uh, avoid such unnecessary deviations or distractions. Next, please. Yeah, I have uh, found a lot of redundant usage in people, whether, uh, whether it is speaking or writing. Many people tend to use these redundant phrases. I have just given you a few examples, but there are um, innumerable usages that you can always Google up and see because of uh, you know the time. I'm keeping track of the time as well. I wanna finish on time. So uh, I'm just gonna discuss a few things here added bonus, 
Right. Bonus itself is something in addition. So why, why should you say added bonus? Just say bonus. That's it. Ask a question. Asking itself is inquiring about something. So questioning and asking have the same meaning. Close proximity. I have put my son in this school considering the proximity, which means it is close by. So proximity is something to do with nearness or closeness. So you don't have to say close proximity. False pretense, the same thing. It's all untrue, okay? So end result. End is a result, okay? The result is something, uh, an ending, right? So it, it both means the same. Unexpected surprise. A surprise itself is unexpected. So you don't have to use the word unexpected surprise. Still remains. Still and remains are both rem uh, trying to say that something is still there. So you don't have to use them together. Discuss about and return back. The last two are found um, among many speakers, many uh, non-native speakers, right? discuss about discuss should never be followed with about and return should never be followed with back because when you return something you're giving it back okay so please return the book you should not say please return back the book right so next put your reader first now when i say put your reader first you should you should get into the shoes of your reader and try and figure out how your reader will interpret your writing. Instead of assuming that the reader can put up with your vocabulary or will understand certain terminologies. So please do not have assumptions. Put your reader first and put yourself in the background. That is very important when it comes to writing. So choose the right font style and size. When it comes to formal writing especially, it is better to stick to formal fonts like Calibri or Times New Roman or Helvetica or Arial, which are more formal uh, when compared to Comic Sans or brush paint, you know, uh, which looks nice, but it, it is not easy on the eyes and uh, it is not professional. And this font size, it's important because Gone is the art of writing, you know, nobody writes with a pen now. It's all uh, via um, uh, uh, the net or uh, the devices that we use. So it is all, uh, we have become very tech savvy. So put it uh, that way, right? So it is important to know and the appropriate reading size or the font size will be 10 to 12 points. So, and you also have to remember to avoid misplaced or dangling modifiers. What do I mean by misplaced or dangling modifiers? Modifiers are something that describe an object or a thing, okay? Uh, uh, it, it's more like an adjective, okay? Or uh, more like a description that you give. Now let's take the example. The torn student's book lay on the desk. The torn student's book lay on the desk. Am I saying that the student is torn or the book is torn? It's kind of vague, isn't it? Because the word torn is misplaced. Now, if I put it in the right place, let's say the student's torn book lay on the uh, desk, then it makes sense. Then it means that the students, that is the possessive form, okay? That particular student's torn book, the book which, was to which is torn, lay on the desk. That way, it'll make more sense. Now, check the usage of tense. We all know that there are 12 different tenses in English. But when you begin writing, if you start with the present tense, stick to this tense. If you start in the past tense or you're using reported speech, then stick to past tense. Please don't switch between tenses in the middle. Tips to follow after writing. All right, you have finished writing something and um, you want to uh, test the waters or you want to check uh, please don't blindly submit it before revision, okay? Before revising or reviewing it for the second time. It is always good to uh, give it a few minutes, hours, or sometimes even days, depending on the content. Give it some time, come back with a fresh pair of eyes uh, and see things clearly. When you come back and do that, do that when you reread your script, you will definitely want to make a lot of changes or a lot of changes, trust me. So it is important for you to come back, 
read with a fresh pair of eyes and then make the necessary changes. You edit and then proofread again. And if you're still not satisfied and if you still think that you need some someone to help you, you can always send your writing to uh, uh, an expert and get their feedback. And that way you will know where, where you've gone wrong and what you can correct. You can also use online tools to enhance your content and writing skills. Uh, you can use Grammarly. I, I believe the basic plan is um, free, but you have the premium plans and the other plans that are paid, but you have a lot of services. Uh, you can even use Boom Essays. Uh, they also help with editing. But I'm not promoting these uh, websites. I'm not trying to curb your uh, uh, curb the development of your writing skills. I'm just trying that these are available and you can make use of it at the beginning level so that you can you can understand, you can see what changes they have made and incorporate it later on in your writing. And you can also even try this interesting tool called Write or Die. This is an interesting thing. I do it uh, sometimes when I'm bored. It's more like a game. You're given a task you're given a word count and a time, and you have to write within the stipulated time. If you fail, you have sp uh, spiders crawling over uh, all over your screen. And if you pause for a long time, the letters that you have already written get deleted one by one. So it is more like uh, racing with time. And uh, uh, can you hear me? It says my connection is unstable. Can you hear me, sir? Sir, can you hear me? It's perfect. All right. Okay. So uh, you should uh, try this tool, write or die, because it gives you a time and a task and you are compelled to write. So it, it really motivates you uh, because you're racing against time and you want to write something, though you're groping for words, you still want to prove something, right? So, and you have to practice writing. Practice uh, 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 writing, you know, you, because you cannot edit a blank page. You cannot say that I'm unable to improve my writing skills without even trying or making an attempt to write. Whether it is a poem or um, a play or a monologue or whatever it is, just write whatever you feel like writing, whatever um, makes you happy or whatever, um, you know, keeps you involved, okay? And before that, you have to read a lot because reading enriches your vocabulary. See what other people have to say. See how they use certain words in certain contexts and try to incorporate it in your writing as well. So reading, come first, reading comes first and then comes writing. So I know that writing is a skill that has to be developed over time, but it is never too late because learning has no end. So I hope you, uh, had something to take uh, with you or uh, you, you have benefited from this uh, webinar because this is my debut webinar and I don't know how uh, well I fared. So, but if you have any questions, uh, I'd be glad to answer them. I think uh, we discussed about this question and answer around, sir? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And yes. in fact, while you're saying yes, it's a debut, I'm just remembered that when uh, Azruddin came, he had hit three consecutive centuries. So today's is the first debut century. So congratulations for that. And thank you, thank you, sir. I'm honored. Yeah. And tomorrow uh, of the master class, we will be having the second session from you. I can uh, announce the session, but since you have done so well, I would like that you should tell what is the topic for tomorrow. And meanwhile, I will take the okay. questions. Sure. Right. Uh, tomorrow we'll be discussing um, means and ways to enhance your oral skills, uh, speaking, I mean, speaking as a part of communication. So because many people think that uh, speaking is something that they cannot do. They can read, write and listen. But when it comes to speaking, they it's like the cat gets their tongue, isn't it? So let's see how we can uh, help you with uh, coming out of it and um, you know, uh, help you with honing your speaking skills as well. Yeah. Ma'am, this is by Rajesh. Can you explain to what extent plain English movement is relevant in legal drafting of legislation or contracts? 
plain english is important so, uh, for uh, for drafting of any legislation or a contract because nowadays they are saying that you shouldn't use such a superfluous language not superfluous but a language to that extent that one is not able to understand so they are saying yes, now so that, focus even on the judgments and drafting like you said it should be case so the, the same way there is an expression that even in the legislation that it should yes. be simple and straight yes uh, i understand that and that is why uh, what i uh, told you uh, when i was discussing through the slides use simple language but within brackets i had mentioned contextual uh, i mean according to the context isn't it so uh, sometimes certain professions require such formal language or jargon remember i told you about jargon sir so sometimes you are required to use that jargon and um, Uh, but if it calls for simplification well and good but if they insist or if there is uh, room for uh, such simplification i will i would always welcome that because you know sometimes the 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 petitioners or the respondents they may not understand this superfluous language like you said so it is it is good to use simple language as as long as it is accepted by the jury because the jury shouldn't think that it is something shallow you don't know how to draft a petition so that way you should consider certain things and i think if it is okay then you can use simple language if you would want to compromise on your uh, you know uh, quality of your petition then yes it is just like what in law we say that the order is null and void whereas you don't yeah. find any difference as such but it is a common uh, tenor of that word which we often use illegal and arbitrary yeah. so it's yeah somewhat uh, juxtaposed together but that's the way how you live in life uh, ma'am this yes. is by yes. first of all i would like to express my gratitude uh, for giving such an opportunity to listen to the webinar of uh, written communication and that too from our favorite professor i suppose someone has joined from uh, who's been your student uh, she, because she has log he or she has logged without name and pinky okay. ma'am i'm feeling so much joy for you today simply overjoyed to hear your lecture it was very informative and interesting as usual once you have guided me and now i'm budding poet and started publishing my poems too waiting for many two webinars i'm sure you will be the first of many proud moments to you ma'am congratulations i will ask her to I post it <laughs> kausalya i think it is kausalya so thank you kausalya yeah. so they say that nothing can be hidden from the guru <laughs> right so e e even from the format of writing you can imagine who's who's come forth yes <laughs> so uh, since question uh, yes this is by lal uh, tejwani can you let us know what are the different types of english used currently profession wise different uh, kinds of english um, uh, i don't understand uh, the question itself different kinds of english in the sense are you asking about formal and informal language or what is it can you throw some light he will pose the question meanwhile uh, like you said you have to read more it says uh, <laughs> lal lal has uh, posted medical as well as legal okay yes um as i told you there are different jargons when it comes to profession a medical person would not tell uh, you know there is a chest congestion probably he'll use a medical term so so that is how it is probably they can simplify it for the patient's understanding but when it comes to writing a report they have to stick to certain conventions certain rules which cannot be overlooked so i think uh, english when it comes to medical register lawyers and um, uh, let's say academicians they all have different uh, ways of writing yeah uh, and mostly these are all formal english uh, we would like to know that uh, uh, i am speaking on behalf of all the participants like you have given the tricks uh, or not tricks on tips we can say that uh, to improve but what are the basic ways if one has to speak of five basic tips wherein one could enhance the this art of written communication you have given the style what has to be done it should be short crisp not too much complicated because sometimes in the overzealousness to write better sometimes you post a uh, word to the effect that you are not able yourself to understand that or sometimes the meaning or the connotation 
is slightly different than actually what you intend and propose to do. That's why they say, like what was being said of Mr. Kushwan Singh, the famous author, that his words were simple, that you never use the uh, yeah. dictionary. She has said, yes, yes, ma'am, I'll go uh, sir, a raja. Okay. And uh, so what would be your five basic tips which one can take forward to, hold, to improve his art of written communication? Any book you suggest or any uh, way to improve whether they should read the newspapers daily, how to go about it? Let's assume uh, there are a large number of people who come from a Hindi medium or a medium of language of the state, and then they have to switch over to the English. How to do that? Well, I understand that there is always this uh, native language influence and mother tongue influence and uh, a lot of problems because sometimes people tend to literally translate from their mother tongue. And so that has to be avoided. But the first thing that I would suggest is reading, read. Read whatever you like. It could be a magazine, it could be a blog, or uh, it could be anything at all, a poem or uh, a fiction, a novel, a nonfiction, anything. I, I, I don't know what book to suggest here because there are so many books on written communication, uh, very good books, but at the moment, nothing comes to me first because um, I didn't think about it, but so, so uh, we'll I will definitely it. share. We will, keep, we will keep it for tomorrow. The first, uh, first yeah, I will the definitely the come up with it in the next session. Yes, I will come up with it so that it will help people uh, to enhance their writing skills. And But the first thing is to read. Because when you see LSRW, the skill that comes before writing is reading. So only if you are able to read, because like I told you, uh, reading is not a skill that is acquired. You cannot see people or hear people talking and acquire it, but it is a skill that has to be developed or honed, right? So it is not inherent. So you have to develop it and that can be done only if you read and if you start writing. It, it can be just uh, a few lines a day. Right. Uh, try and write a few lines a day and uh, try to put it on Grammarly or try to check for mistakes. If you open uh, MS Word and start uh, typing, you can see where you're going wrong. You can check for capitalization and uh, grammar and punctuation. You always have this grammar and spelling and it, it, it underlines the mistakes. So you can right click on it and see what options are available. And if you're stuck with a word, you don't know the meaning, you just right click on the word and uh, look into the list, you have synonyms there. And from the synonyms, you can call out another appropriate word, or you even have smart lookup where you can look up for the meaning or, or the usage of that word in a sentence and make use of the dictionary widely because sometimes we assume the meaning of a particular word and use it. And uh, finally uh, end up uh, giving a different picture of what we intended. So it is important to read read quality books. I know that reading uh, is also a dying habit these days, but at least read something on social media when you spend time. You can read messages that are being forwarded, or you can read blogs, whatever that interests you, but read it in English and not in your native language. I see people uh, even changing the language of their devices. You know, uh, you open the laptop, you go to Google, you put Hindi or Tamil or whatever your native language is and, and uh, look into things. Even your mobile, everything is in Tamil or Hindi or uh, whatever uh, regional language that you use. So avoid doing that. Try to use English more and try to be exposed to the language. Only then you will be able to write well. Um, one is you say read. And how do you practice more? And how do you call out? One is that, uh, rightly said, a uh, large number of my staff is also using this Grammarly. Grammarly is a good word to be used while you use the email. It's a good, effective thing. Yes. yes. Only question is that one can use the first the free version and then one can always go for a professional version. And uh, what other tip would you like to share with them in respect of written communication, which can actually put things forward? Like they say, uh, as you rightly said, the practice makes the man perfect. So practice definitely one has to do for the impro improvement of the written communication. Do you believe that editorials of the newspapers help you to do better or a simplicity reading a newspaper 
uh, within since there are around 15 16 pages there are pages which is our your taste you can read that let's assume you're a store a sports buff you read that and then also you can enhance your knowledge so what is your take on that i believe that editorial um, uh, articles are a good source because they they are rich in vocabulary so it will help you enrich your vocabulary there are different words that are used i mean um, uh, and when you're stuck with the word it always triggers you to go to go and look up uh, for the meaning so that way i would say that yes uh, you know uh, the editorial section is much better when compared to the sports section or any other section in a newspaper taking a newspaper as an example because sports will always have words related to uh, players and games okay whereas in the editorial section you will find articles on different topics so you will have a, a wide knowledge of uh, different topics and you will be exposed to vocabulary pertaining to different fields so i suggest you can begin reading with whatever you like and slowly move on to more complex stuff hello yes sir okay so all right okay so sure sir <clears throat> well uh on behalf of uh, the organizers i would like to thank everyone uh, all the participants for your time and patiently listening to me um i hope you have uh, benefited from this session um i will look forward to your participation tomorrow as well for my uh, session on oral skills thank you and have a good evening for me it's almost midnight so good night yes uh thank you uh, i mean somehow there was a goof up on this thing so thank you to all the participants who are watching us live on the facebook as well as on the youtube uh we are actually impressed and the recording of the session would be uploaded on the youtube of beyond law clc we have already posted uh the same again i can post it so those who want to uh we visit this or they can share it with your friends and as i said at the first instance when ma'am said that uh, i don't know as she was saying that there were certain butterflies but she has come with the flying colors we have all been enriched with the knowledge she has shared with us so do stay connected tomorrow for the second part of this master class of enhancing our skills thank you the link is mr yadwindra Uh, beyond law clc and i have sh shared that you can go to that channel uh, thank you everyone stay safe stay blessed